Hi, everyone. Uh, my name is Lois Kerfman McInnes, and I welcome you all to the Supercomputing Spotlight webinar series. Today, we're, we're excited uh, to share with you another webinar in our series that, that we began just this year, focused on outreach to the broad community to uh, it, it inspire people to um, learn more about high performance computing. So we're recording this session, so it will be posted on our YouTube channel. And so uh, there'll be opportunities for people who are not able to join us in person to follow up to watch the video. This webinar series is one of three complementary initiatives that we're pursuing in this IM activity group on supercomputing. I'm currently serving as chair of that group. So I, along with the other officers, are um, really trying to raise awareness of the great opportunities in high performance computing and to reach out to um, a broad range of people to excite them about what, what we're doing. I'd like to encourage you to take a look at the website for the activity group uh, given here by this, by this webpage. And this is a really good resource for information about all that's happening uh, among the activity group activities. And in particular, I'd like to draw your attention to the upcoming conference on parallel processing, which will take place in March, 2024. Now, is a great time to consider submitting a paper to the proceedings uh, call for this conference. Papers are due on June 30th, and I encourage you to go to our website to learn more about, about this. There's a, a really good, good set of technical um, chairs in place for, for the conference also, and the website can tell you more about other ways to participate in addition to, to submitting papers. Also, another important opportunity is to nominate people in our community, your colleagues, for three prizes. The nomination deadline for each of these prizes is July 31st, 2023. And we especially draw your attention to the Early Career Prize. We know we have a lot of wonderful work happening in the community, uh, uh, especially among our early career folks. So, so please do consider who you know in your community and, and consider nominating uh, some colleagues for these awards. In addition to the Early Career Prize, we have the Best Paper Prize and the um, Career Prize for Supercomputing. And now I, I'm really excited to introduce our speaker today, Karen Wilcox. She will speak about digital twins and how high-performance computing is helping to advance the, the front in personalizing the future for complex systems. Karen uh, is from the University of Texas at Austin, and she's well known as a leader in our community. She is the director of the Odin Institute for Computational Engineering and Science, uh, and also the associate vice president for research and a professor of aerospace engineering and engineering mechanics at UT Austin. She spent many years as a professor at MIT prior to, to moving to Austin, and she's uh, accrued many, many honors and recognition throughout her career for, for many contributions to the community. Uh, and I myself had the chance to get to know Karen a bit when we both served as officers in a complementary activity group, the SIAM CSE activity group a few years ago. So without further ado, I am uh, happy to turn the floor over to Karen. All right, wonderful. Thank you very much, Lois. Uh, let me go ahead and share my screen. Okay. All right, so uh, you should be seeing the slides now. Um, so again, uh, thank you, Lois. It's great to be here. And uh, I also want to say a big thank you to the SIAM Activity Group on uh, Supercomputing for uh, running this webinar series. I think it's really an important thing to uh, try to communicate the uh, impact, in this case of supercomputing and all the mathematics that underlies it, to a broader audience. And so as requested by the activity group, this is a talk aimed more at the public. So if you're uh, here today for mathematical details, you're at the wrong talk, uh, you'd be happy to, to talk with, it, with uh, you on those mathematical details at a different time. But today's really about uh, the excitement around digital twins, what is a digital twin and how is high performance computing playing a really critical role through digital twins in addressing societal grand challenges. So today's really going to be about um, imagining the future and uh, recognizing that even though we might not see it, high performance computing is 
impacting the future and in fact the present of our everyday lives. Uh, so we're going to talk a lot about the future, but before that, we're going to start off uh, by diving a little bit into the past. And I want to start by taking you back to the Apollo program, so back in the 1960s and the 1970s. And uh, during the Apollo program, each time NASA launched a vehicle into space, they would also launch a simulator on the ground. And this simulator would mirror the systems that were being put into space and it would sit on the ground in, in Houston. And uh, this practice became particularly critical in the Apollo 13 mission in 1970. And I'm sure many of you know the story uh, because you've seen the movie. During uh, Apollo 13, the spacecraft suffered a malfunction. It became seriously damaged and it became stranded up in space. And then the story goes that the NASA mission controllers were able to feed in data from the physical damaged spacecraft to rapidly adapt and modify the simulator that was sitting on the ground so that the simulator now matched the evolving conditions on the real spacecraft stuck up in space. And then the mission controllers were able to use that data adapted simulator to run the scenarios and design the strategies uh, used to bring the astronauts back home safely. So I want you to think with me of the core elements of that story. Uh, first of all, there were models of the real system. So the real system is our spacecraft stranded up in space. In this story, there were models and the models in this Apollo example uh, was the simulator that was on the ground. Second, there were data. And in this case, the data are the data that uh, were coming from sensing systems on board the spacecraft and also observations being made by the astronauts. Now, when things uh, get, start to get interesting is when we can put the models and the data together. Mathematically, this is a process that's known as data simulation. So we have data, we have models, and with data simulation, we're continually updating the models as new data are collected. So the models are not static, but they're continually evolving. And in this particular Apollo example, this is models following along as the state of the physical spacecraft is changing, uh, re representing it, it's damaged. And of course, this data assimilation is what's so important because it's what makes the models personalized to the particular situation at hand. And so then that brings us into the fourth element of the Apollo story, which is the element of prediction. Because the models have now been updated and personalized, they can be used to make predictions and recommendations that are tailored to what's going on today, right now, uh, again, in this particular case, the spacecraft and its dynamically evolving state. So now let's come back to the present day. So 50 years later, the story of models and data and data simulation, all mixed today with high-performance computing is really revolutionizing the way we design and operate engineering systems. And as I'll get into a little bit later, it's also revolutionizing the way we think about systems outside of engineering uh, in our natural world, uh, in the biological world, and uh, really all across society. So the story today is similar to that Apollo story, but there are a few key differences. So uh, let's start with the data. So today, yes, we have data. And in fact, we have increasing amounts of data especially as sensing technologies have become smaller, more lightweight, cheaper, and more powerful. So we have much more data than ever before. Uh, second, the models. So today we have powerful computer models. In that Apollo story, the models was a physical simulator. The simulator there was a physical mock-up of the system. Today, when we talk about a simulator, we're usually talking about a virtual simulator. So that means our models are powerful computer models that we solve with high performance computing. And these models encode all of our knowledge about these complex systems. They encode our knowledge of the rules that govern how these systems respond. Mm -hmm. uh, so rules like Newton's law of laws of motion, the familiar F equal MA that you saw in high school. And why are these rules so important? These rules are important because these rules are what let us predict how our system will respond. So as uh, one example from, uh, from today, from the modern era, era uh, what you are looking at here are pictures of the uh, unmanned aircraft that I have in my research group. 
And as one example of these powerful predictive models that we solve with supercomputing, we have uh, what are called finite element models of the wing, or actually of the whole structure of the aircraft. And these models let us answer questions like, uh, how should I design the wings so that the aircraft wing can withstand the forces uh, of, of takeoff? Or how much will the structure deform? How much will the wing deform if I fly this aircraft in a very aggressive way, turning around corners? Or what happens if the wing gets damaged? Can I continue to fly? How well can I continue to fly? And just like in the Apollo example, when we start to put data that we can collect from all those uh, incredible modern sensors that we have on board the aircraft, we put that data together with these powerful predictive models using this notion of data simulation, we can start to create, again, this notion of a personalized, dynamically evolving model of our engineering system, of my aircraft in this, in this particular example. And it's this personalized, dynamically evolving model that we uh, call a digital twin. So a digital twin, what is a digital twin? Again, it's a personalized, dynamically evolving virtual model of a physical system. It uh, encompasses all those ingredients that I talked about when I started with the uh, Apollo system. What you're looking at here is a uh, couple of pictures of my airplane at its first flight test a few years ago uh, in Massachusetts. And when we think about building a digital twin of this airplane, there's a couple really important points to keep in mind. First, our digital twin, our virtual model is not generic. It's not just any old Telemaster aircraft, but it's a digital twin of the individual aircraft of the one that is right now parked in my garage here in Austin. And the digital twin is going to reflect the individual properties of my aircraft, which might be different to somebody else's aircraft, different to my neighbor's airplane. And again, this digital twin is not static. It's not like I create the model and then I'm done. This model is a living, evolving representation so as we are flying and maintaining my aircraft, we're collecting data. We're collecting data from the sensing capabilities on board the vehicle. Uh, we're collecting data from the inspections that we make after each flight. And we're assimilating those data to update the digital twin so that as my airplane ages and degrades and gets damaged and gets repaired over its lifetime, the digital twin is following it along. And if you imagine uh, now what you could do if you had a digital twin like this, just imagine what you could do with it. Imagine you were an airline or maybe um, you're an operator of unmanned package delivery drones and maybe you have thousands of aircraft in your fleet. And imagine that you had a digital twin for each one of those thousands of aircraft. Uh, so imagine again what you could do with it. You um, could use the, those digital twins to make optimal decisions. Uh, you can, can use that to make decisions about which aircraft to assign to which mission. You could use it to make uh, decisions about when to maintain all the different vehicles, when it's time to retire them. So this is a really exciting idea. This term digital twin is by now about 13 years old. Uh, it was coined, the term itself was coined in 2010 in a NASA report. Uh, although, you know, this idea uh, goes back goes back many years. Uh, and as another sort of historical example, um, this idea of having data and models and data simulation and dynamic evolution of the virtual model is one that's uh, set at the heart of weather forecasting for many, many decades. But 2010 is when we got this term digital twin. And since then, uh, digital twins have seen a tremendous amount of focus in the engineering world, especially in the aeros aerospace engineering world, um, and especially in support of structural health monitoring and predictive maintenance for aircraft and aircraft engines. But as I'm um, describing all of this, for those who are listening today and who are not engineers, you're probably um, sitting there and wondering, you know, is this something that only applies to aerospace engineering products or is it a, uh, an idea that that is much broader than that. And of course the answer is, is yes. There are just so many applications where we could think of the story of data models, data simulation, high performance computing and decision-making predictions and decision-making 
really to revolutionize the way we make decisions across science, technology, and society. So I'm going to run through just uh, a few examples, and these examples are mostly drawn from uh, research that we do here in the Odin Institute uh, here at University of Texas at Austin. So to start with some examples uh, from the engineering world, we're starting to see digital twins of uh, buildings to enable energy efficiency, uh, digital twins of buildings and other civil infrastructure to enable virtual health monitoring and predictive maintenance, uh, digital twins of wind farms to optimize efficiency and to minimize downtime. Uh, and the picture that you see here in the top left, digital twins of next generation manufacturing processes as we think about uh, optimally controlling manufacturing processes and also building digital twins of the systems as we are creating them, as we're manufacturing them. Another, uh, I think, really exciting example is digital twins of, of uh, space systems and digital twin, a digital twin of Earth orbits, particularly as we start to think about space security, space sustainability, and uh, the growing problem of, of managing space junk. So many, many examples in engineering. As we turn to think about the natural world, world, again, there's a tremendous amount of interest in digital twins for oil reservoirs, farms, forests, coastal areas, oceans, ice sheets, uh, even talk of a digital twin for all of planet Earth, uh, all to help guide sustainable decision making. And again, you see here a couple of the examples from the Odin Institute. Uh, the, the model there of the uh, of Antarctica and particular focus on the Antarctic ice sheets uh, from Amagatas and uh, a model of the Arctic. And what you're looking at there is um, the ice ocean interaction around Greenland that comes from Patrick Heimbach. Then that brings me to the medical world where, again, this idea of a digital twin has so many potential applications um, advancing medical assessment, diagnosis, personalized treatment, in silico drug testing, so many different use cases, cancer patients, heart patients, and, uh, and, and many, many more. So I think you can agree that this is a really exciting idea, and it could be transformative in so many societally critical areas. Uh, it's just, I think, exciting to, to sit and say, what if I had a digital twin for X? How would I then be able to make decisions and drive things in a way that uh, really is, is, is very bene beneficial? So again, to bring us back to today, we've certainly seen some impressive early successes and we're starting to see digital twins getting deployed in the real world and, and uh, having this kind of positive impact. But it's also really important to keep in mind that everything that I've outlined in the last five minutes uh, is still not a reality today. It is still beyond reach to have a digital twin of an entire aircraft and all the complexity that comes with that. It is still beyond reach to have a digital twin of the Arctic or a digital twin of the Antarctic. Uh, it's still beyond reach to have a digital twin of a cancer patient. And I wanna spend the next few minutes in the talk thinking about why that's true. Why is this such a hard problem? And why even with today's supercomputing power is it still beyond reach uh, to have digital twins of these complex systems? So one reason and really a, a central reason uh, for why it is so difficult is because of the many different scales that these complex systems cross. So I want you to think back to my airplane wing where I told you we were building digital twins to help with the structural health monitoring of that aircraft. So as we think about that problem, changes in the microscopic properties in the materials, so very, very small uh, changes in the material properties, small elements of damage can have very big effects at the full scale of the vehicle. They can really uh, cross scales to impact the way the vehicle operates at the full scale vehicle. If you wanna think about a medical application, we know that phenomena at the cell and the molecular level interact across scales to have effects at the scale of a, of a, of a full human being. And just like in the aircraft example, we're talking about going from the very, very, very tiny up to the full human level, up to the, the order of meters. 
Um, so think of something like a cancer patient. We need to be able to resolve those physical changes at cellular and molecular molecular levels, but then we also need to get up to the scale of a full organ like the like the brain. And not just that, if you think about the time scales, we might need to be able to resolve dynamics and changes that take place on the scale of minutes or maybe even seconds. But then we also need to be able to simulate out for months or maybe even years of a patient's lives. And again, even with the incredible supercomputing power that we have today, models that resolve all those scales, all those scales in space and all those scales in time are just too expensive. They would take years, decades, centuries to run those calculations. So the models are, uh, are, are, are still beyond reach. So then you might say, okay, but what about all the data? Uh, we talked about uh, all these wonderful, lightweight, accessible sensors. Can't we just build digital twins from all the data we have? And here it's really important to keep in mind that even though we talk about big data, and yes, we often have a lot of data measured in gigabytes, maybe even terabytes, it is true that in most engineering, scientific and medical applications, the data are actually very, very sparse. The data are almost always indirect and they're noisy. As an engineer, I can almost never actually measure what it is I wanna know. If you think back a couple of slides ago to that picture of my aircraft wing, and you remember seeing those sensors glued onto the surface of the, the wing, I'm trying to uh, understand what's going on inside the structure, internally, the structural health of my aircraft wing, but what I have are indirect and noisy measurements from the outside, and then I need to try to infer what's going on in the inside. And the same is very much true in medicine. Uh, a medical practitioner is almost always working with noisy and indirect observations, observations taken from the outside, trying to infer what might be going on inside an organ where we almost certainly can't make observations directly. So we don't have enough data. And even if we did have enough data today, that's still not enough because that only lets us characterize what's going on now. And if you're trying to build a digital twin for a cancer patient, understanding the now is really only the very beginning of, we, of, of where you start. Of course, the key game is to make predictions, predictions about the future. How will this individual cancer patient respond to a particular treatment re regimen? Uh, we wanna do this without the trial and error that's used today. And so we need to be able to make predictions. And what's more, we need to be able to make predictions with the level of confidence that support these huge decisions where lives are at stake. And all the data in the world today is not going to tell you about what might or might not happen in a future that hasn't yet been realized. So the data are not, are not enough. Okay, so that's just maybe uh, two of the, the, the grand challenges, the challenges of scale with the models and the challenges of uh, not having data to be able to make these challenging predictions. But it's not hopeless. Uh, lucky, luckily uh, for us, there's a great deal of hope that we can overcome these big challenges and actually realize all that exciting potential of digital twins that I talked about. And what is the hope? This is where mathematical modeling and modeling and high performance computing really come into play. So let's start with the first part of that. Let's go back to what I talked about earlier with those models, those powerful predictive physics based models that I mentioned earlier. I talked about the physics based models that we have that let me predict how my aircraft wing will respond under different flight conditions. Uh, another example, these are the mathematical models that encode the governing laws of nature that describe how a cancer tumor grows or how a tumor might respond to radiotherapy treatment. Uh, these are the mathematical models that encode the physical principles that help predict the motion of the Antarctic ice sheet under different future temperature scenarios. So we have these powerful mathematical models that would let us uh, make predictions. As I already talked about, the scale at which we need to solve those models is uh, is very, very challenging, but that, that's, a, that's a different uh, challenge. So we take these mathematical models, we apply sophisticated numerical methods to them. We come up now with numerical models, and this is where the supercomputing comes into play because these numerical models now are incredibly complex and uh, with modern mathematics, modern algorithms, uh, can be solved at scale on, on supercomputers. 
We bring in the data, we combine the predictive models uh, together with data using data simulation, using uh, inverse theory, using methods like machine learning. And then we wrap all of this in an outer loop of decision making. And so as you look at the ingredients on the slide, what you can see is that it's none, none of it's it's not any one thing alone. It's not the supercomputers alone. It's not the mathematics or the physics alone. The power is really in bringing all this together, bringing the high performance computing together with powerful mathematical modeling that gets you predictive capability, embedding in the physics and the domain knowledge. And when we start about to, to think about bringing these things together, this is where we can really take computing to the next level and really start addressing societal grand challenges. So if there's one thing that you leave my talk with today, it's uh, the message that there is so much more to computing than just using it to drive retail, entertainment, business decisions, or for, um, for artificial intelligence that may answer questions or write essays for you. There is so much more to computing than just that. The vision that I'm sharing with you today is about computing with the ability to make predictions about complex systems like our planet, like our bodies, predictions about our future that can really start to drive towards better decisions for, for us uh, as the human race. So now I want to spend just the last couple of minutes uh, digging in just a little bit deeper to some of the technical ingredients that underlie this notion of a digital twin. And I'm going to focus on the mathematical and computational ingredients. As I said at the beginning, this is not a technical talk, so I'm not going to go into technical details, but I do want to go that one level deep, deeper just to give you a sense of what are the, again, the mathematical and computational ingredients that uh, make all of this happen? And where are the areas where we need to push the frontiers of what's possible to make digital twins a reality? So starting at the top here, again, domain knowledge, predictive physics-based modeling and simulation. Uh, in my mind, these are absolutely central if we are going to build digital twins that can predict into the future and support these societal grand challenge uh, decisions that we need to make. And again, I really wanna emphasize that uh, despite the fact that we have made as a community incredible advances in modeling and simulation and that we have phenomenal, unbelievable supercomputing power, we are still not yet at the point where we can truly uh, do modeling and simulation across all those scales for something like a cancer patient or for something like the, uh, the climate at the scale of, of full earth. This remains a, a grand challenge. Uh, next, uh, uncertainty quantification. Everything I've talked about today, uh, as we start to issue predictions, as we start to drive decision making for these complex, high consequence problems, it's not enough just to make a prediction and say, hey, Lois, here's the answer. Lois wants to know, well, how confident are you in that answer, Karen? Where are the sources of uncertainty? Where, uh, how have you factored in my risk pre uh, preferences? Again, this is a grand challenge. How do we make all these predictions? How do we drive decision-making, not just with single point estimates, but also understanding all the uncertainties in the problem and factoring that in as we start to build our digital twins? Optimization and control. If you think back to the picture with the concentric circles, that decision-making was really the outer loop, the outer edge of that circle. How is it that we uh, drive decision-making uh, with these sophisticated mathematical and computational methods? Uh, we distill them into optimization under uncertainty, control under uncertainty uh, problems. And even though it's not here on the slide because I'm really focusing on the computing and the mathematical, the interaction with the human is an incredibly important part of that recognizing that for many, many applications, digital twins will be decision support for a human decision maker. And so thinking about how uncertainty quantification, optimization and control uh, will interact with human decision makers. Again, we need to push the frontiers. Then uh, on the third line here, that brings us to our computing technologies. I've mentioned high performance computing a number of times today. And of course, high performance computing plays a huge role in helping us do those complex simulations at scale. But again, as we think about uh, pushing the frontiers, we need to be thinking about edge computing. 
Uh, if I have a digital twin, how much of the computing is done at the edge, on the system, on board the aircraft, uh, maybe in real time, maybe on a lightweight computing system where I have lower precision than what I'm used to in my uh, sophisticated uh, supercomputing system. Thinking about how we architect all of that so that we're leveraging a combination of uh, high performance computing on the ground with edge computing again on board, um, really fantastic and important challenges there as it applies to our mathematics, to our algorithms, to the way we think about uh, building and evolving digital twins. And the next row here are some of the mathematical methods that I really see as enablers for digital twins. So starting on the right, data simulation, which I talked about uh, playing a central role in dynamically evolving models and updating. Uh, inverse problems, the classical problem of uh, having indirect noisy data and inferring what is going on uh, maybe inside a complex system. And then surrogate modeling recognizing that our predictive physics-based models are the ones we would like to solve, but maybe we're doing that computation on board an aircraft and we've got just a fraction of a second to make a decision. So we need to invoke an approximate model, some kind of a surrogate model uh, that we can, can uh, use again while understanding the uncertainties and what confidence we have in the, in the discussions, uh, have, have in the, the, the decisions. And again, surrogate modeling, inverse problems, data simulation, these are not new topics. These are uh, areas of research that have been around for decades, uh, but thinking about how we push the frontiers in those topics to really enable this vision of a digital twin, I think is very important. And then lastly, artificial intelligence and uh, machine learning, uh, really exciting developments in these fields going on uh, and thinking about how we bring these methods in a way that's scalable, and that comes with the level of reliability and robustness that goes hand in hand what we do as uh, engineers, scientists, and uh, folks in the medical domain. So uh, with that, let me close. I really do think Digital Twins is such an exciting scientific grand challenge that is building on next generation mathematical modeling and high performance computing. And uh, with that, I will be very happy to uh, transition and uh, take some questions and answers. Thanks, Lois. Thank you so much, Karen. What, what a, an exciting talk. Uh, and already we have a number of questions that people from the uh, audience have raised. I encourage anyone who would like to ask, ask a question, please type it in the Q&A chat box when you, when you have a chance. Also, I'd like to encourage everyone to please provide feedback on the webinar. Uh, in the chat, I, I put a link to a, a feedback. We, we'd encourage you to let us know not only your feedback about this session, but also your ideas for, for future sessions. All right, so back to questions. Um, let's see, we'll start, start with the first one here, Karen. Uh, the question is, which exists first, the physical object or its digital twin? This is a great, this is a great question. Um, and so I can, uh, to Chinadu's question, I can give you my future vision or a future vision for the community is that every time we design a physical engineering system, we would also design its digital twin at the same way. We would really think very intentionally about the digital twin, about the virtual representation of the system. And you could imagine um, that with this way of thinking, the digital twin can help support through the design process. It can help support through the manufacturing. I mentioned in the middle of the talk, uh, you know, a lot of interest in uh, digital twins of manufacturing processes. And you can imagine that as the physical object sort of rolls off the manufacturing line, its digital twin is going with it. Um, so I think that's a, a great vision. We There is some pieces of that in existence already in some examples. The second part of your question says, is digital twin different from the simulation models usually done before manufacturing? Uh, I think there are some commonalities, but to me, the key difference is this two-way interaction between the virtual and the physical. So not just thinking about a simulation model that somebody would create, it's used to uh, drive manufacturing decisions and then it's kind of thrown away, but rather creating this virtual model that's going to be assimilating data and growing and evolving together with the with the physical. So it really takes those ideas to 
to, to a new level. Thanks, Karen. Uh, we, we have a lot of great questions here. I, I'm going to go out of order because there's one here that really resonates for the, the SIAM activity group on supercomputing. So we'll take that one next. A question by Paul Rosen. When you mentioned the limitations of current supercomputers, uh, what scale do you believe is needed compared to what we can do today to, to oh, really be able to yeah. tackle digital twins? This is, this is a great question, Paul. And, uh, you know, I often think uh, there will never be enough. <laughs> the moment, um, you know, the, mo the moment the computers get more powerful, the problems get more complex. So, so this is a, you know, this is a very deep question because um, the, I think the first important point to make is it's not just about bigger computers, right? We have exascale machines uh, today, and it's not just about bigger computers and more scale because there are um, you know, limitations in the way you can translate an increase in scale for the computers to, uh, let's say, a decrease in the time it takes to run some of those simulations. And what it really takes is a combination of increased uh, computing power, but also thinking very, very differently about algorithms and how one can come up with algorithms that actually will make use of more powerful and having more processes on supercomputers. David Keyes gave a very nice talk in this uh, Spotlight series uh, a little while ago, and he actually talked in quite some detail about these issues around scaling. Um, so, you know, what, what scale do I believe is needed? Um, first of all, I think actually we need new mathematics and new algorithms to better take advantage of the supercomputing power that we have today. And second, we need to be thinking about the next generation of supercomputing that will scale even beyond what we have today. And at the same time as we're thinking about the hardware and the architectures and what might be coming, also thinking about the algorithms the methods and the applications that are going to come along along. But again, just to, to sort of reinforce a point that I made it, made during the talk, we are very, very far away from being able to do something like simu simulate a full cancer patient, to be able to simulate the complex dynamics at the level of a, of a full, full tumor. We are far away from that. Thanks, Karen. Here's another question, this one from Logan Fry. What is the process for creating a digital twin for a new type of entity? For example, a cardiology patient's heart. Yeah, that's a, that's a good question, Logan. That's a long answer to this one. Um, so, it's reading the rest of the... Um, so I think, you know, it, it depends a lot on the setting you have, but you, you're asking an example here for a cardiology patient's heart. Um, in this in this situation, you know, I would think of the digital twin having at its core this mathematical model. So cardiology is an area where these predictive physics-based models that that represent the flu fluid and the structure and the electric activity inside the heart. Uh, this is an area that has advanced a great deal over the past decades, and so the community. And I should tell you, I'm an aerospace engineer, so I'm not speaking with a great deal of expertise in cardiology. Uh, but nonetheless, the community has uh, really pretty impressive models, uh, those mathematical and physics-based models um, that can be solved, again, with supercomputing at scale. So to me, that would be the core of a cardiology patient's digital twin. And then you're going to combine that with uh, the state of the art and what you can do with the data, so the imaging that, for example, that can be taken for an individual patient. And by the way, this is not just a future vision. This is actually a reality. Uh, there are companies, I'm aware of one company uh, named HeartFlow that already has this kind of process in place. Again, the core, the physics-based model, the imaging for the specific patient, assimilating that patient-specific data into the model to build the digital twin and then using that digital twin to make, to make predictions. So I think that's one way to go about this process. If you were in a different setting, um, and let me give the example of the uh, digital twins that GE use for their aircraft engines. In that setting, there is a ton of data. There's so much data being collected from those aircraft engines that maybe in that example, you would be thinking about the data as being at the core of your digital twin and wrapping your mathematical models around it. 
So, uh, you know, really a lot of uh, variability. And maybe just the last thing to say is this is this is this is really at the frontiers. I think the community are still working to understand what are scalable processes to create digital twins for these kinds of complex systems. Thanks, Karen. Here's a, another question. This is from Abu Asadazaman. He he asks, how can you determine that the accuracy of the digital twin is acceptable? Yeah, this is this is a, a very good question. And I would say um, there are many challenges in uh, actually reaching the vision that I laid out today. I think this is one of the biggest uh, remaining challenges, Abu, is first of all, how do you know how good your digital twin is? How good are these predictions about the future? Uh, second, how do you know how good you need to be? I mean, we can never make perfect predictions, but how good do you need to be? And how do we quantify all of those uncertainties in a way that's scalable? And then in cases, in the many cases where the digital twin is interacting with a human decision maker, how do you communicate those uncertainties? How do you uh, incorporate the, the risk pre uh, preferences? These are, these are all challenges. And I think this is, uh, again, one of the frontiers where the field really needs to push forward, largely an open question. Thanks, Karen. Uh, we'll we'll take um, we have lots of great questions here. Um, we're committing to to conclude our session um, within a few minutes, so we'll we'll take one more question now and then possibly have some offline chat when we're finished. Um, he, here's a question from Sang, who says, "How do you recommend handling prediction errors of machine learning models while dealing with accurate numerical simulations in digital twins?" Yeah, this, um, this, these are all great questions. Like, these are all tough questions. Um, so um, let me back away from the error, the, the error part of the question for a second and say that, you know, again, I think we've seen a lot of interest and a lot of progress in uh, combining machine learning models with numerical physics based simulations. But again, I think that just that question of how one gets the best of both worlds. How do you best combine your, your physical base, your physics-based model, your mathematical model with a machine learning model, something that you've learned from data? Uh, how do you put those together in, in the best way? I think there's still uh, much more to be done there. And then on top of that, this, this sort of notion of confidence, when, when do you trust uh, numerical simulations? I talked a lot about the predictive power of physics-based models, but of course, physics-based models themselves have assumptions. And, you know, for example, a structural model that is really, that I really trust when my aircraft is in a pristine state may become inappropriate, may become inaccurate when that aircraft gets damaged. And so this question of, trust of errors and predictions uh, of confidence these are again you know sort of to repeat something I said earlier these these really are, are, are very big challenges where we're starting to see interesting ideas arise but I, I really think um, that's the that's the frontiers and answering the question that you're raising is is uh, one of the things that I think the community really needs to take on and by the way that's something that's going to take collaborations among mathematicians, statisticians, uh, computer scientists, computational scientists, um, high performance computing experts, domain scientists, it really is a challenge that cuts across many communities. Thanks, Karen. Uh, and thank you to everyone for your insightful questions.